Hello everyone, coming to you live from my kids' bedroom. So uh, the joys of uh, Zoom presentations and working from home. So let's get the presentation in question. And I kind of apologize for making this way more Christmassy than it has any right to be. But, you know, we had a uh, Christmas jumper day in the UK yesterday. So supporting my diva Christmas jumper and presenting to you 12 days of game dev, which I will not be singing. If you're familiar with the song, that's not going to happen. But I've been working in the games industry for almost 10 years now. Next year will be my 10th year. And over that time, you know, I've I've seen a lot, seen it all, uh, picked up some tricks, picked up some things not to do. So I thought I would try and summarize that down into 12 little bits and bobs or anecdotes of things along the way. And I would have loved to have had more time to make it fit with the 12 days of Christmas, but alas, it was not on our side. So a little bit about me. Like I say, I've been in the industry for almost 10 years now. I started in a small studio as a designer. Um, I was quickly moved into a more production-y role as a creative product producer. After that studio, I went into the indie space where I was an artist, an animator, the business developer, the marketer. I did literally everything that wasn't the code for a series of mobile games that I released with my partner. And those were called Glyph Quest. And that was a lot of fun. So we spent and then maybe five or so years releasing games as indie developers. We got to travel with our games. We got to show Glyph Quest at Tokyo Game Show. It was a lot of fun. I highly recommend it. And then my current job, I'm working as the lead 2D and UI artist at Deep Silver Dambuster Studios, where I run a small team of really talented 2D and UI artists producing all of the UI art, doing a lot of UX work with the design team, and also all of the wonderful 2D stuff that you'd see in like any open world game that has, you know, a fake version of reality and you need to have your fake version of Starbucks or whatever. We come up with all of the like the graphic design elements, the 2D design elements for that too. So that's a little bit about me. That's that's kind of what I've done. I've worn lots of hats. Find the smaller the studio, the more of the hats that you have to wear. So that's always, you know, a fun thing about working for smaller indies or, or doing it all or trying to do it all yourself for a very small group of people and then working in a much larger studio at Dambusters, you know i wear fewer hats but there's still you still never seem to manage to just wear one so let's get on to some 12 days of christmas or 12 days of game day number one think outside the console um i hope kind of when we do like the rest of this presentation that None of this comes as a surprise, or not as a big surprise. Like maybe there's some tips in here that you haven't heard before, but generally speaking, like I hope you kind of have heard this before because we can tell straight away when a portfolio or an application comes into us that somebody really loves video games. I mean, they wouldn't be applying for the video games industry if they didn't. But it's really disheartening to see that portfolio that's just reproducing art from video games. Everything in it is from a game that they've played before. We need to see stuff that's not just from the games industry. We need you to think, pull your references in from other sources, from film, from books, from music, from other pieces of art that you've seen, from theater. You know, it can be from literally anything, hobbies that you've got. That's what we need to see because when we just look to video games, we just start reproducing or churning out the same stuff over and over again. And you can see where games are like super, in like, uh, and you know, they're super in that genre, they're super in that type of game because they're just referencing every other game in that genre, whether it's through the mechanics or through the art style. And we need more breaths of fresh air, you know? Pokemon wasn't designed because somebody liked playing Pokemon games. It was designed because they liked collecting bugs and they wanted to create that experience for a new generation that, you know, we're potentially not going to be able to go into wetlands and wildlands and go butterfly hunting. And that's the kind of thing that we need to bring more in. I think institutions like in education, if you're an educator and you're watching this, think of more ways that you can pull in outside influences that are not just the games industry. We love to see it. We love to see a portfolio come in that has got so much variety and and. and I recently hired an artist whose previous job was painting prosthetic eyeballs. Like, 
that's the kind of stuff we would want to see because it just breeds more creativity. It just makes more interesting games. Day two, apply for the job anyway. If you're a student at the moment or you're between jobs or you're looking to make your break into the games industry and you're looking at an application for a studio that you think would be a really good fit for you, they're working on a project that you're really excited about and you've read the job description, but you don't take every box, apply anyway, get that application in. Because trust me, as someone who's been a hiring manager, someone's gonna have read the title of that job application and decided to apply for it anyway, having zero experience or any relative like artwork in their portfolio, speaking from like an art point of view, because that's you know my current job where I, where I do a lot of my hiring. I see a lot of portfolios come in where it's like, well, you read that there was a job available and you decided, I'm gonna put my horse in that race anyway. And I know that imposter syndrome is very real and it is the little gremlin that a lot of us have to live with that kind of just sits on our shoulder. Try your best to put that gremlin in a box bury it in the bottom of the ocean if you can and just ignore it for half an hour once you fill out a job application and apply anyway we like i said in the previous slide we love to see people coming in with more experience in other areas because it just helps fuel the creative process it helps bring in new ideas it helps to liven up a team especially if you've been working on a project for a long time with the same people bringing in new people from outside the industry or with different experience or have worked on different types of games is always excellent because it just rekindles that fire underneath everybody. So if you're looking at a job application and you're like, I've got maybe four of the things that they're asking for, stick your application in that. Because as your employer, um, when we take people on board, our responsibility is to teach you how to do the job, right? We need to sh you to show us that you've got like ability, that you've got talent, that you've got enthusiasm for the industry, that you want the job, and you have some of the technical skills that we need. But everything else, we will teach you. You know, we're not expecting you to know exactly how we use a piece of software, especially if it's an industry like a, a studio that has all proprietary software. Right? We're not expecting you to know all of how to make the game, but we need you to have like those ideas and that creativity. And when you do apply for that job, tailor your portfolio to that job, every job. Um, that's like a slide from my last portfolio where I was applying for a UI job. And I went through and I made sure that every page of my portfolio was just the highlights of the UI work that I had done through the studios that I'd worked in through my indie career. And every single page was just, this is what I worked on. Uh, this is really important as well if you've worked on group projects or you've been a person in a bigger team where other people have contributed. We want to see the whole product because it helps contextualize the work that you've done. But we also need to see the bits that specifically, this is what you contributed to that. But you need to tailor that portfolio. Hiring managers at any size studio, right, we get hundreds of applications for a single job advert that goes out we would love to spend all of our time just going through these portfolios and finding the perfect candidate. We just, it's not feasible. We don't have that time. What we need to see is a really small snapshot of your best work, a really concise, tailored portfolio of, this is everything that I've done that I think you're looking for that meets the description that you've previously read. By all means, in your application, in your CV or as part of that portfolio, have a link to further reading. Link your art station, link your, your Instagram, wherever it is your website that you've got the rest of the bulk of your work that you've done, absolutely stick that link in for further reading. Because if we see a 10 slide portfolio that is excellent, like every single one of those images speaks to the role that we're hiring, or we can see there's definitely an ability, there's a talent in here, something we can nurture, we're going to click that link to go and have a look at the other stuff that you've done that you felt was maybe not relevant, but it's still your best work because it's what you've put out there on your online portfolios. But I do not have time as a hiring manager, and I, I don't know a single hiring manager that does, to go through every single art station site, every single website, 
every single Instagram feed where it's literally everything you've ever created. Don't have time to go through that and find the key items that are like, this is fantastic. This is an artist I can work with. So do the hiring manager a favor, tailor that portfolio, make it short, make it sweet, make it the best work you've done and give us a link to that further reading. Because if the first bit captures us, we will click it. We will have a look at your own stuff and be nice. Like, I don't know how many people I've met in the games industry, but it is a teeny tiny industry. It's a small world and it seems to get ever smaller. Um, and we remember you, you know, if we met you at a conference, if we met you at an event, if, uh, if we met you when we were touring our game at different shows, we remember when your CV comes up on our desk, that first impression, that, that time that we met you, we remember. And your legacy carries on through every job that you have. So. Do everybody a favor, be nice. I'm not gonna get too preachy on that one, just it's a small world, so remember that. Producers are your friends for the fifth piece of advice. Um, if you're familiar with this meme, the producer is Gandalf, and you're the developer, and the ball is the feature that they're trying to cut. Producers are often the bearers of bad news. They're the timekeepers. They're the people that are trying to get the product shipped. If you're fortunate enough to work in a big enough studio where you have dedicated producers who work with your team, who are on top of your tasks, who are pushing for the final product, like everybody in the studio, they are trying to make the very best version of that video game. They are not trying to trick you. If they turn around and say, you don't have time for this, see, it's got to go. It's not because they're the enemy, okay? So be nice to your producers. I've had to be a producer, and it's not the the most rewarding job when you have to go into a, a meeting and be like, guys, I'm so sorry. We have to pull this feature, or we have to shrink it, or we have to cut some content around it. They're your friends. Be good to them. They'll be good to you. Be honest with your producers. If it takes you twice as long to do stuff that your estimates say, let them know, and they can make adjustments. They can rebalance things, they can speak to your higher ups, they can try and take some work off of you. Work with your producers. And if you are a producer and you're watching this, I, I appreciate you. You're excellent. Thank you for all your hard work. The sixth day of Christmas, jams are good for you. And I know that there's a lot of talk about crunch culture and how jams just lean into that. But there's a very big difference between Elective crunch, I, I want to just try and bash out a game in 72 hours and force crunch where you're working on a project and your line manager has told you, we need a couple of extra hours from you. When can you, when can you do them? And the reason why I really love game jams so much and why I recommend them to just everybody that wants to get into making games or is making games is they help keep your brain active, they help keep you fresh especially if you've been working on a project for a long period of time. If you've been stuck on one game for a year or more, throwing in a couple of jams just really helps relieve a lot of tension or a lot of stress. It helps you get out other ideas that you've had to like keep on the back burner because we're creatives. We're always thinking, we're always coming up with new stuff. Having a quick game jam or an art jam, uh, Lee Petty, who works at Double Fine, he is uh, a, a big, like, uh, pusher for the art jams. Like he does them with his teams a lot. I've been fortunate enough to do a, a workshop with him where we did an art jam and it was great fun for all of the artists to sit, sit together, put a load of ideas into a hat, draw random things out and be like, great, now, now make some art based on this. And I think for designers and people who make video games, like having a little jam, like throwing some ideas into a hat, pulling some stuff out and being like, what kind of crazy little thing can we make on this? It's really good. It's a really good breakup, especially if you're stuck in a long project, if you're stuck in like a rut, if you're kind of suffering with um, burnout, if you're suffering with creative paralysis, like having a game jam, having an art jam. I don't code, so I don't know if code jams are a thing, but I'd be interested to find out if they are. But they're just really good ways for you to get some new ideas out, relieve a bit of stress, have a bit of fun. Work on something that's completely different to the thing that you're currently working on. Just take it easy, you know, know your limits. Don't think that even if you're going to global game jam, don't think you have to be at your computer the whole time. The last few game jams I've done, I've had eight hours sleep on the nights, you know, 
I've set us like a stall out. I've been like, right, you can achieve this in this much time. And that includes food and sleep breaks. So know your limits, push to try and get something out that's awesome and creative, but take it easy because it's elective, right? You're doing this for a fun time. It shouldn't feel like, it shouldn't be super stressing. It shouldn't feel like too much like hard work. Number seven, accessibility is everyone's responsibility. So this is something that I've seen a few talks on in the past as well, and I wholeheartedly agree with it, um, especially as someone who works in UI. If you're relying on the UI department to make all of your accessibility features, you failed along the line. Accessibility needs to be something that is thought about from the start of the project and throughout. It's on audio, it's on design, it's on art, it's on UI. Everybody has a small part to play in making sure that games are as accessible as possible. If you've designed a game in such a way that making features, making it so that you don't have to have holds or you don't have to have mashes, like if you've done that from the beginning, then it's when it comes to the end and it comes to putting all those options in and putting all those tick boxes in, it's already been done. If you get to the end of the project and then somebody points out, oh, but that's not a very accessible way of playing the game. Can we take out holds for doing stuff? And you haven't had that roadmap in from the beginning. You can't just tack those things on at the end. They really need to be thought about from the beginning. There's loads of resources online as well that are really accessible to everybody. So I highly recommend checking them out. <clears throat> um, caniplaythat.com is an excellent resource for information on how to make games as accessible as possible, how to start thinking about it from the beginning, how to make sure that you build those systems so that when you come to the end of the project, it's not that you're having to shoehorn things in for a day one patch. You've already got them. So now you just have to choose how you present them. Um, and I think that thinking that somebody else will come up and, and fix this for you is a mistake. And it, we're not saying like you have to have an easy mode for your video game. If you're making a roguelike and you're you want it to be as punishing and dark soulsy as possible, then that's on you and that's fine. But just know that only a niche portion of people who want to play video games will be able to play that game. If you want to make a game for everybody to play, if you want to make a game that's out there for as many people as possible to consume, then you need to be thinking about those things from the very beginning. It's not just it's not good enough to be like, I want to make a game for everyone to play because I want to make loads of money. If you're not thinking about all of these things, all these steps along the way that you need to consider. And incidentally, wanting to make video games because you need to make bank because you need to pay rent. is That's not a bad motivation, okay? It's a fine motivation. Everybody needs a job, right? And you've chosen one of the, the most interesting and fun and creative industries to have that job in. So it's okay that, that everyone needs to pay rent. Number eight, <clears throat> share ideas, because we'll all make better games for it. So going to events like this, I love coming to uh, different conferences and festivals and talking and doing exactly this, sharing this ideas. I'm very much about laying the ladder down behind you, not pulling it up, helping to raise those around you, helping to bring more people into the industry, sharing ideas, sharing information, we all just benefit from it. We all grow stronger from it and we can all make better games because of it. Um, I recently went, well, I recently, oh my God, time has like shrunk and it's everything's like yesterday, but also two years ago because of all of what's going on. It was a while ago, I went to UX Summit and I, if you're into UI or UX design or art, I <clears throat> highly recommend that conference as well. And Ahmed Salama did a talk, he works for Ubisoft now, he did a talk about things that they were using on Horizon Zero Dawn, which I now use when I'm making games because they were just really good design practices for how to communicate ideas, how to visualize your UX and show it to other departments so that they can understand the impact of the decisions that they're making. It's called the Design Artifact and it's basically a barometer for how much information should be on the screen at any given point, depending on if your player is super leaned into the game, they're like, it's button mashing moments, they're in combat, they're really invested, or you know they're in a safe area, they're fully leaned out of the game, they're reading a journal entry, 
very super useful tool. Highly recommend finding that talk if you can find it. He's an awesome guy as well. But that was a great idea. And I was like, that's going to make my job so much easier when I need to communicate to my design department why we need to do things in a certain way or why we can't present all of that data at the same time because it will be overwhelming to the player, right? So having all of these tools, having all of these things that we can share, super important. I also help with limit break, which if you're familiar with those, with the limit breaking, I believe they're international, they might be in the UK, but it's a community of mentoring. It's taking on like mentees and sharing knowledge, helping them, giving tips and advice or just confidence boosts, whatever somebody needs because they've shown an interest and the passion for video games. They want to work in this industry. They want to join us, but they don't know how to get started. So if you are able to, if you have the capacity to share ideas, get out there, volunteer at things, mentor, go to, you know, when everything goes back to normal and we're able to go to these events and try and bring more people in and get those ideas out there. Because like I say, we'll be better off for it, you know, Number nine, leadership is a skill. So, oh, incidentally, if you haven't seen Ted Lasso, excellent TV, highly recommend it. Real tour de force in how to be an excellent leader, just through the very particular lens of football, but it applies to everything. I don't even like football, but that TV show, very good. But leadership is often, people get promoted into lead roles because they're very, very good at their job. They're very, very good at the role that they do. They're a brilliant artist. They're a brilliant coder. They're a brilliant musician. They've been working at a company for a length of time. They get promoted. And the hierarchy will be that they get promoted into a lead role. But they are terrible leaders. They don't know how to give feedback. They don't know how to, you know, how to bring somebody up. They don't know how to mentor. Leadership is not just about being the very, very best in a particular field. In fact, I would say that in my studio, I am not the best to the artists that we have on the team. I have better to the artists. It's my job to make sure that they are able to do their job really well, that they are able to perform, that they are able to deliver. If I was the best artist, I would be a roadblock in the production of any project that we worked on because everything would have to go through me. Everything would stop with me. I would be the bottleneck. It's much better that the other people on my team are trained up or mentored up to being better than I am, but I'm having to do all the stuff that they then don't have to do, like go to the meetings or, you know, work with production on the schedule or write reviews and, and things like that, you know, answer all the emails. I'm there to soak all of that stuff up. They're there to produce the brilliant art. If, uh, if you do find yourself like wanting to be in a leadership role, you want to be that person, you want to take people on board, or maybe you've been promoted and you don't feel super confident in your ability to train into mentor into getting results out of your team i highly recommend radical candor which is a book by kim scott it's a very good tool to have in your belt when it comes to this is how i can get you know results from my team how i can communicate with them how i can build them up so that they can be autonomous so that they can go off and do this stuff without me having to watch every step of the way but leadership is a skill. It is something that you need to train in. It is something you need to develop. I was fortunate enough to do a lot of management training before I even got into the games industry, which is, you know, why I ended up moving from just a design role to more of a production role, because you had that vocabulary. You're able to speak to your team. You're able to drive out results from them. And it's something that has followed me all the way through. So if you want to be a leader in the games industry, or you already are, but you're not totally on sure footing get some extra training speak to your your like if you have a development team at your studio if you have a hr department that you can speak to about this get some extra training in get some budget for some external speakers to come in and, and really push your team and, and teach them the, the tools just like with everything that we do in this industry there are tools that you need to know to be a good leader to so seek them out learn them and as ted says believe on the 10th day, culture is more than just free coffee. Uh, but coffee is important, super important. Fuels 
so much of the games industry. Again, like if you're if you're looking for a job, if you're at a position where either you're between jobs, you want to move into a different job, or you're a student, you're coming into the industry, and you find a studio and they look really cool, and they speak to you about their culture and the stuff that they do, and they're like, oh, we've got a foosball table, we've got a drinks fridge, we've got a gaming area, you know, we, we can get people in to cut your hair, it's all good, free gym membership, that's great. Those are all excellent perks. But they're not necessarily the culture of a studio. And if you think that that's the culture of your studio, you've gone wrong somewhere along the line. The things you need to be offering the people that you work with, the things that you need to bring to the table are like, how we're going to develop you, how we're going to progress your career, how we're going to raise you, how we're going to make you the best version of yourself, how we're going to encourage honesty, how we're going to encourage people to be able to speak their mind so that they're not holding back frustrations, so they're not building up resentments. The forms that we're going to offer our staff to have that let out, to have that place where they can relax, where they can have a fun time, where they can get some R&R. &R. You know, having that policy of like, we, we do game jams, or we do art jams, or we do, you know, we have a GDC vault that we, you know, encourage people to take time to study on those, or we we do talks in the studio where we share knowledge. All of that stuff is way more important than free coffee. But coffee is also very important, so don't, don't skimp on the coffee, guys. But all of that stuff is the culture. And that's the memory, that's the stuff that people who work at your studio are going to take with them wherever they go. If they end up making their own studio, those are the things that they're going to want to recreate, the things that they're going to want to emulate, not the free foods at the table, right? So do think about your people and their happiness because it is important happy people happy developers make better games if they're not having to worry about stuff if they're not frustrated all the time if they don't if they don't know how to to voice their opinions if they are able to be happy in the workplace and concentrate on delivering the game that they're making you'll get better games you'll get better results you'll have happier people your staff turnover will be far lower you know people will want to work for your studio because the people working there will be just singing its virtues at every opportunity. So do you think about if you're in a, a studio, if you are starting a studio, think about those things. How do we elevate our teams? How do we make them want to come to work? They already chose to work in the games industry, which means they're passionate about the things that they do. So don't exploit that. Don't and don't kill it out of people. Right celebrate it, raise it, raise the people that you work with. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. Point 11, and this kind of like leads into the leadership thing as well. Critique is not personal, ever. Um, if you're in, I, I guess this applies a lot to design as well, um, but specifically for art, if you're getting portfolio reviews or you're getting reviews on your work, it is never personal. If it is personal, that person is doing you dirty and tell me, I'll have a word. But it should never be personal. It's never an attack on you as a person. It's just the thing that you've produced right now isn't what they wanted or doesn't hit the mark or isn't quite right yet, okay? If you're giving critiques, you need to be able to separate personal opinion for the sake of the project, the sake of the, the product that you're making the sake of like, we have an art direction. The thing that you've got right now, it's not quite there, but let's talk about how we can get it there, right? Not, it's never an attack. And if it, it should never ever be an attack. And it is really, really hard. When you're an artist, and you get critique on your work. It's really hard to separate. Even I struggle sometimes. You, you have to like, take a moment, get some fresh air, remember. It's not about you and your ability. It's about the thing that you've presented right now that isn't quite right. So what are the steps that you can do to get it to being right? It is not if you are, you know, in that position of leadership and you're given these critiques, it is never good enough to, to say it's not quite right. I don't know how to fix it, but I'll know when I see it. Never acceptable. Always work with the person to get it to the next stage. Always have a clear vision. If you're going to turn around and say a thing isn't right, know why and know how to fix it or be able to work with the person to get to that result. 
And if you're getting that critique on your work, it's not personal. Don't take it personally. Just know that the stuff you're producing right now can be better and strive towards that. When you've done a few portfolios and you've looked back at your work, the stuff that you did back in the day when people were saying, it's not quite right and you got upset about it and you look back on it now and you're like, oh yeah, no, it wasn't quite right. It will happen, trust me, you'll get there. But it's never a personal attack. And 12, don't read the comments, ever. Um, if you work in um, community, that's your job, if you're a community manager, I got props to you because you've got a much stronger personality than than I do. You've got better salts than me because as an indie developer and having to, you know, be the owner of the, the games we were putting out on mobile and having to go in to reply to all of those one star revo- reviews is crushing, soul destroying. People say mean things on the internet. You know, they have that auto- that that thing where they can just be this other person they choose to be, and they will always say negative things over positive things that's just people like to complain i guess but don't read the comments the first read the rule of the internet and if you are reading the comments and they're just you know back to the previous point if it's a, a critique if it's an honest critique of the stuff that you've done it should never be personal if it's a personal attack just throw it in the bin stick it in the ocean you don't need it never read the comments unless it's your job and you have to in which case uh, i can't help you but power to you and that's it that's all, all my 12 bits from the past 10-ish years. Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, I hope this hasn't been terrible. If you don't like Christmas, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you to the uh, these folks for producing this wonderfully Christmassy themed deck because the notice was short. So I appreciate all the help. I'm going to stop sharing. I guess you can't <laughs>